Today, we are thrilled, Sandra and I, to introduce to you Dr. Michael Snyder. Michael is a uh, world-renowned expert on wearables and technology that can help not only record disease, but possibly even predict the onset of disease before it's apparent with any other measurement. He's the chair of the Department of Genetics and director of the Center of Genomics and Personalized Medicine at Stanford University. He runs a team of over 100 scientists at the Innovation Lab at Stanford University. And he's also working on a good number of studies that focuses on the prediction and prevention of disease before they are apparent by the standard markers that we use in traditional medicine. He's also the founder of QB10, which is a company that uh, focuses on acquiring data about disease, and also the founder of January AI, which is a continuous blood glucose monitoring company. Today, we're going to be talking about many, many different things, and the conversation is very interesting and I think can help all of us uh, determine which wearables are best suited to help monitor our health needs. We're going to talk about the microbiome, and he's and Michael is uh, working with a group of 109 people um, in a study to find out what a healthy profile actually looks at, looking at many, many different uh, measurements. He will talk about how uh, serious problems were discovered with some of these measurements, such as lymphoma, heart disease, the idea that as we get more and more pieces of the puzzle, we can create with artificial intelligence, possibly in the future, a predictive model of disease that is already present or is about to become present. So these, the idea behind this is that to profile changes in measurements before patients become symptomatic and when therapies can possibly become even more effective. We also will be talking about how wearables are a powerful health monitor for the general population. He will talk about how in himself, how wearables helped diagnose Lyme disease before it was apparent by blood testing. Also, how it picked up COVID. And uh, I will also mention how I have some experience in this with my partner who also picked up COVID wearing a wearable. The idea in the future may be to follow millions of people simultaneously, and we can possibly predict outbursts of diseases like infectious diseases in different parts of the world since half of the planet have cell phones, 3.8 billion people. If this is connected to monitoring, we can use this to predict disease around the world, which would be a great move forward for uh, public health. And we'll also talk about heart rate variability, how this can be measured and what it means, continuous glucose monitors, how we can help prevent even mental disease like depression and anxiety, and then the technology of a drop of blood where 2,200 items can be measured in one drop of blood. We'll also be talking about polygenic risk scores, what they mean, and how genetics plays into this. And finally, the environment in the exposome where there are devices that can measure pollutants and other factors in the environment and and how we can use this to prevent the diseases that are caused by pollutants. So let's get started. And we're very excited to speak to Michael and um, hear this fascinating conversation. Okay, Michael, well, thank you very much for uh, you know spending this time to uh, tell our listeners and us about all these measurements we do. And as a nerdy kind of anti-aging uh, cardiologist, I do a a ton of measurements, you know, and uh, and I know that, uh, you know, my feeling is if you don't measure it, you really can't do anything about it. So, 100% uh, agree. Yep, 100% agree. Very excited to have you here today. Um, Thanks. Well, fun to be here. Love talking about all things. So, 
viable. <laughs> so let's start by how did you get started with this? I know your background is genetics, correct? Yeah, and actually, I mean, I was trained as a typical molecular biologist, and um, I, I think our initial claim to fame was people used to study genes and proteins one at a time, and we came up with a way of studying, we are studying yeast at the time, all the genes at once, so 6,000 things. And so the idea was seeing a bigger picture look at biological systems, and we invented a lot of technologies over the year for studying thousands of genes and thousands of proteins uh, all at once. A lot of technologies are still used a lot today. And in 2009, I moved to Stanford and we wanted to apply these same ideas to medicine. I, I think medicine's broken. I think we tend to, you know, look at things in our own little lens and it's broken in many ways. And, and one way in which it's broken is we do incomplete measurements on people. We really measure very, very few things. And so, uh, having invented a lot of technologies for this when I moved to Sanford, it seemed like a great way to start studying people in it with a much bigger picture, take as many measurements as possible and then sequence their genome, measure their molecules. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about wearables and things. Uh, another great way to measure people. So and we actually also want to change it another way. We wanted to study people while they were healthy and keep them that way versus what, as I'm sure you appreciate, is these days we would call sick care. <laughs> which is treating people after they get ill. And so so really what our main things were to be able to use big data to try and get a picture of people's health and then again keep them that way, catch illness at its early time. So we'll profile people longitudinally. We can talk about all that. Sure. Sure. And as doctors, as you know, we have been trained in sick care. Right. So for us it was also a big transformation trying to figure out how not to do only that. That's right, of course, to continue to do that. hundred percent agree. Yeah, we got to keep people healthy. Absolutely. But also to understand how do we do a better job at preventing. Yep. So you are highly measured guy. Like I think you wear a bunch of uh, wearables. And I do. Here's my four smartwatch. <laughs> hearing aids I have on me, they do more than just hearing. They measure lots of things. <laughs> so what's you know I do a lot of measuring on my patients and I uh, you know I, what I find interesting and 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 useful is actually since we uh, do hundreds of biomarkers and I measure uh, body composition and I measure we have aura rings and I we measure you know clear I don't know if you have, if you've heard of the new artificial intelligence CT scan with artificial intelligence overread it's called clearly. You know, as a preventive cardiologist, these type of measurements are super valuable, you know, in terms of using for, you know, prevention of heart disease and, and heart attacks. Now, what what's the goal in, in your measurements of yourself? And I know you've done studies with hundreds of people with with many measures. You know, what 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 is your goal with this? Yeah, it's the same idea as yours. So we do these deep profiles, we like to say on people, where we'll sequence their genome once, their DNA, and make predictions about what they're at risk for. We've come up with new ways of doing this. But then on top of that, we'll measure as many molecules out of their blood and urine, even something called the microbiome, which you probably know it's important for your health. It's in your gut. Uh, has, you know, 100 trillion cell bacterial cells all digesting your food, making essential vitamins. We'll measure that too. And so, uh, and then we do a lot with wearables. And, and as you point out, we've been following a group of about 109 people for roughly 10 years now, a little over 10 years, in fact. From I'm one of them. We've been following me for 13 years. And it's the same idea. We're trying to get, understand what a healthy profile looks like. And, and it's pretty amazing just from the first three and a half years of profiling people, of the 109 people, 49 had a major health discovery, meaning we caught some with early lymphoma two people with pre-cancers, two people with serious heart issues, so on and so forth. Some of these we would like to think are life-saving, like the lymphoma and the heart issues. And and what was special about it was that all of these were found pre-symptomatically, meaning the people thought they were healthy, they had no signs of symptoms, yet we would see these things. That, and no one technology did it either. Sometimes it was a genome sequencing, like we caught someone who had a mutation and a cardiomyopathy gene. This will be right up your alley. And then they developed tests, and sure enough, they had a heart defect. Young guy, and his father had actually died of a heart attack in his 60s, aunt had one in her 50s, and it's pretty clear then this gene is the likely culprit. And uh, he, his stress echo said he had a heart problem, so he, he's on medication now, all picked up because of his genome sequence. 
plants, predicted something was probably off. And same thing for another person. I had a mutation in a gene that said they should have certain kinds of endocrine cancers. And once you know it, they actually did a whole body MRI and had an early thyroid cancer, and that was removed. They had most of the thyroid uh, left, and so they never needed a replacement therapy. In other cases, like the lymphoma was picked up through imaging. In other cases, some of the molecular assays found these things. Often it was combination of assays. And so what we like to think is that if your health is a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, where, you know, medicine today gets like six or seven of these and tries to figure out what that picture looks like, whereas we try and get six or seven hundred of them and get a much clearer picture of your health. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but I think it's it's much, much better than what we're doing now. And so we were able to find all these things, once again, pre-symptomatically, and many of them are life savings. We've gone on to spin off a company called QBio that's actually, uh, um, it's a medical version what I just described. So what I'm telling you about a lab project, if you will from this profiling but we have this is what we do we if we think something's useful we'll spin it off in a company and so what this company has been able to do is just do just that a medical version they also do whole body mri and once you know it same thing they found in the first hundred uh people they found ovarian cancer prostate cancer even early pancreatic cancer which you may know is never found early or nearly never and they happen to find that through again through these deep data dives and the longitudinal data turned out in both our research and in this company be really important you're seeing shifts in people's patterns and you know something's up you'll see this in their molecular profiles before they're symptomatic and yeah. so again we think that's key it's exactly what you were saying about you know we're, we're following them while they're healthy that's disease early let's keep people healthy yeah it's interesting my partner uh, one of my partners is a uh, pharmacist, and I see all my patients with with him. He's an expert on nutrition and supplements, but he's very fixated on following his aura rate. And yeah. here, he re- he saw his heart rate was elevated, and he didn't know why. It was elevated for a day or two, and then shortly thereafter, he tur- he was he he tested positive for COVID. And yep. so the aura ring actually predicted the COVID in him before he actually became symptomatic and this uh, yeah we're really keen on wearables or remote sampling so in fact that's one of our biggest uh if you will things we're known for these days so about eight years ago when these were first coming out as fitness trackers we realized they're pretty powerful health monitors so we put them on our cohort and and right away I actually discovered within a year well maybe it was a year and a half i picked up my lyme disease same way i saw my heart Rate went up, my blood oxygen dropped. That was from a pulse, something called a pulse oximeter, as you know, measures oxygen. So I saw my heart rate jump up. I had a feeling, it, and then later I got a fever off and on. I, I thought it might be Lyme because it was two weeks after I was in rural Massachusetts with Lyme infested area. And I was in Norway at the time. So I went and visited a doctor. I warned him it might be Lyme and he drew blood and saw my, my immune cells were up and said, yep, you got a bacterial infection. Uh, he wanted to give me penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline. And it got a little tense, but he did give in and gave it to me. And I got tested when I got back. I was lying positive. And I'd given blood right before I'd gone to Norway as negative. So I see converted during that time. So it was very, very clear. So my, my heart rate and, and um, pulse ox first picked this up. And then we went on retrospectively to show we could pick up respiratory viral infections just with a smartwatch. Uh, and we published this in 2017, and then, as you point out, COVID came. And so we've actually scaled this up. We're running a big study. So any listener who wants to join our study, that would be yeah, fantastic. We'll put a link to the study because I think that's a fact. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. So well, let's, let's go back to your Lyme disease. Did you go yeah. back in the data yeah. and uh, and see the trends like shortly after you became infected to see what you know what was happening? Did you? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it was, again, in my case, it really was a prospect of study in the sense that I saw this go up in real time, uh, these changes before I was symptomatic. I knew something was up. So we we did, yeah, pick it. That's what first alerted me. And then I did get, as I said, I, I later got a fever off and on, but I, I knew something was not right. And, and, and you went to doxycycline right away, so were you able to track it as you were getting treated? Uh, is that something? Yeah, it went to normal pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> it, yeah, so within a day, it was, uh, yeah, everything was back to normal. And you take it for two weeks, and I took it the whole two weeks. But uh, my case, but, uh, you know, it was in a sense, 
you know, very valuable, right? Because it was early detection. Lyme disease is a big deal because if, and I never got a bullseye. So if I hadn't caught this, you know, I could have had chronic Lyme, which is not a good spot to be in. So yeah, it was really quite powerful. And then uh, yeah, I, 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 I think what it's what it tells us that something's happening. We don't know exactly what the sensitivity is there, but you know it's not. Oh, it's even better than a yeah. I'll tell you another fun story too. So so with this respiratory viral stuff, um, as I say, we we publish this and then we're improving the algorithms and and so we have this cloud based system. We can follow millions of people. Uh, with their high rate and we have an alerting system we'll let you know and uh, if you're if, if you get a red alert it means you shifted from your baseline doesn't prove it's COVID as you point out but we know there's a stressor and we can see a median of three days before symptoms your people are getting red alerts if you will wow. they're seeing these shifts and you don't know for sure whether it's you know Lyme it could be there's other turns out workplace stress is the number one trigger of this a psychological thing i know with more data we can tell the difference between workplace stress and, and a respiratory viral infection uh we know already we can tell the difference between a bacterial and a viral infection but um anyway we so we need more data that's why but it does work and my, my own personal covid story was i was great getting ready to go to new york city and much like your friend when i uh w i woke up and i was a little bit congested was it allergies uh, what's going on so i do an antigen test and i'm negative i can show you the data and i look at i look at my smartwatch alert and i'm positive so what i do i got on the plane because my antigen tests are negative i go to new york city before i can go to the meeting there the next morning you have to get tested on a bright positive so i had to spend a whole week in a hotel room in new york all because I listened to my antigen test and not my smartwatch. And that's the point. These are really, really sensitive. We think you need as little as two beats per minute increase. And the average is seven or eight for COVID. You can tell when someone's off their baseline, there's a shift. And so, but you don't know exactly what it is. With more data, we'll get better. But it's enough to tell you something's up. And many of these things you can contextualize, meaning if you run a marathon, your heart rate will be up for several days. And <laughs> that will set off red alerts and but you know you ran a marathon chill out uh and and same with excess of alcohol a little bit of alcohol will do it but uh, for our alerting system so it, it's really sensitive it's way more sensitive than a thermometer so if you think about it temperature is a 300 year old concept we've been using to tell when people are ill but it doesn't work that well for COVID, right because half the people never get a fever i didn't get a fever uh, and so it, it just doesn't even make sense. Resting the heart rate is the number one trigger, if you will, for when you're off your baseline, so to speak. So we, we think this is really powerful. So you said that we can detect the difference between a viral infection and a bacterial infection right now. What is that difference? And well, it's magnitude for one thing, and I'm sure it's going to be respiration for the other. <laughs> The, well, if it's respiratory bacterial infection, it could get trickier, but like the Lyme versus the respiratory virus, that's very, very easy to spot in terms of the type of signal. So I know when we bring in things like respiration rate, heart rate variability, we'll have to see what's different. Now, I don't know if at the end of the day, I'll be able to tell the difference between COVID and influenza, right? I just don't know if we can do that. Uh, although either way, I don't think you want to be going out spreading it around uh but nonetheless uh but what i'm pretty sure we'll be able to tell the difference between respiratory illnesses and other things and the nature of, uh, of the bacterial infection even for respiratory viral one is different so i think the nature of the signals in the smartwatch will be different as well but we've done machine learning we can actually tell uh like to some extent when people are getting anemia from a smartwatch and things like this there's a signal on all these things so so we think and even a little bit of believe it or not diabetes signal insulin resistance you can pick up from a smartwatch it's not a clinical grade measurement but it's enough to tell that something shifted from your baseline well one of the other benefits sounds like if enough people have this is geo with geolocation you can see if there's an outbreak you know if there's an yeah yeah you happening in a certain location it's probably not work stress. It's probably some kind of viral or bacterial outbreak. That's another good point. You can weigh that in the a probability score, if you will, the chances that, you know, if everyone else is going up in your area and you go up. And if it's cheap enough, you know, in underserved countries where there's outbreaks of uh, 
you know, cholera and things like that, it, it would be very helpful in, in situations like that. I think. To, 100% agree. Yeah, you know, intervene very early. That's the, that's the, uh, that's yeah. the, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, you may know that 3.8 billion people have a smartphone. So half the planet has a smartphone. So if you pair that with a smartwatch, you have a health monitoring system for half the planet. It's pretty incredible, right? And I think these things will be 20 bucks in the future. So we should be able to get them out to everybody. And they won't just be for the, you know, the wealthy and well to do. Uh, hopefully they'll be for everyone. Yeah. And so, you know, I do a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of testing, you know, over a hundred biomarkers. And, and what I find is that everyone's sort of unique. They have their own sort of set of, uh, you know, changes in their environment, but I, I can see something's happening. You know, if I do their, their complete set, I, I don't know what's happening, but I know something's off with this patient. And then we, we typically find something when, when that happens. Yeah. You dig in. Yeah. When you, I can tell you another story there in this group of honor nine people we were studying uh there's one guy he had a, a liver enzyme elk you probably know it it was running always running in the normal range but he was always at the low end of the normal range and then on one of his visits we measure people every three months it had jumped up twice as much but it was still in the normal range so nobody said anything to him but he mentioned it to me he said mike why why did my thing go up twice as much i said i have no idea but go get measured again it was a week later and he did, he went out of the normal range. So it was clear his trajectory, right? And if he, because of medicine today, well, he's in normal range, he's fine. But nobody was following his trajectory. And because we could see that we, you know, he did the extra test, went out of normal range. In his case, he could actually fix the whole thing by diet. He shifted from sort of a, a you know, more typical American diet to actually a vegan diet. And I'm not saying that would work for everyone, but it did work for him. It actually brought it right back to his normal range. He's and kind of we're, we're very focused on nutrition. Completely believe that as a, as a possibility. Sure. Yeah. Now you wearing or wearable watches. You wearing something. You said, uh, and you can you tell us and can you tell our audience, our listeners. Uh, what what is what and what are you measuring yeah so you know, the watches they measure so that's the fitbit and apple i don't know if you can see that like garmin and of course my company since i'm like i'm in silicon valley so we spin off companies uh that we think will be useful and um yeah they all measure high rate heart rate variability and all pretty accurate most watches these days are pretty good for that um, and uh, some physicians will say, oh, they're not that accurate. They're actually way more accurate than what you'll measure in a doctor's office because that first measure in the morning, it's always spot on unless they're off, you know, something's off with the person. Uh, but they'll measure, some of them measure blood oxygen, some measure uh, something called galvanic stress response, which is not used much in medicine, but it's valuable. It's measuring conductance on your skin. It's a sign of stress or skin dryness. Uh, uh, some measure... Um, what else? They'll measure your skin temperature. Some of them are accurate, some not so much. And there are different resolutions, meaning they're sampling, you're measuring uh, at different rates, if you will. And we're using that, like the time I got COVID, I was wearing these watches. I haven't analyzed it. But we can go back in principle, we will do this to say, which of these four watches is the most accurate for detecting COVID and why? Like, do you have to be at a high resolution or is a low resolution good enough? Is the skin temperature you know of this watch which is more sensitive better you know can we ha what data types are the most valuable for detecting disease if you will that's what we're trying to do and i'm sure that's very relevant for cardiology everything you know, all areas of medicine so that's the next question you said we're measuring heart variability mostly and uh, so partly is the disease correct the infection disease that you that you're trying to detect but what else Hard variability and well, other thing. Heart rate variability, uh, just to look. And resting heart rate, you know. Is the, the B2B variation on an electrocardiogram. And it's imperceptible, but it's very important. The more variable it is, the better it is. And this is a Yeah, it sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? But that's the case. Yeah, if you're, your beats are, they're supposed to be variable. <laughs> Has to do with how your nervous system works. No, but it's a, it's a good predictor of heart disease you know it is a lot of patients with an fib or ventricular tachycardia in uh and cardiac sudden death that their heart rate variability changes 
uh, you know, before yep. they have been bent. Absolutely. Yeah, so these watches are going to be very, very valuable. And don't forget, they're measuring you 24-7. So they're following you all the time, passively. And so they're basically following your health. And I like to use the analogy of a car that, you know, your car, when you drive it, it has sensors on it. And it's relaying that information back to the dashboard. And, you know, hopefully most of the time it's all running fine. And uh, some of it's very valuable, like your gas gauge and your speedometer. And hopefully you don't see, you know, alerts. But every now and then you do because something went off. And there's sensors measuring that. They sense it and they run it to your dashboard. And you know to be on the alert. And I think that's what we need for health monitoring. And that's why, to me, the wearables are so powerful. They're following you. <laughs> And then they can send these alerts. It's like uh, get like the engine check, get the check, get yourself checked. Nice and yep, yeah. absolutely. But you know, it would be great. I always thought that you know, if you know, we have a lot of time that we're sleeping in bed, you know, seven, eight hours a night. If we could get completely head to toe monitored while we're sleeping, you know, I think that could prevent a lot of disease. You know, it's the best time to follow health. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, and uh, you pick up a lot when people are sleeping. Obviously, sleep apnea is a no brainer, but you pick up other things as well. The other big area of interest that I'm sure your listeners would be interested in is glucose monitoring, something called a continuous glucose monitor. So I usually wear one of those. So they'll they'll measure your glucose uh, every five minutes. And you may or may not know, but 9% of the U.S. is diabetic, 33% is pre-diabetic, and most of the pre-diabetic don't know it, 90% don't know it, but 70% of those pre-diabetics will become diabetic within five years. So this diabetes, it's worse than the COVID pandemic in my mind. It's, a, it's an endemic that's just absolutely awful because it leads to all kinds of problems, including heart failure and such. So, so, and most people don't know it. And what's special about it is that people's reaction to food is very different. So uh, first of all, we're all, uh, the, it's called type 2 diabetes, but it's many different forms of type 2 diabetes. And you can actually follow... Um, people's glucose dysregulation with these monitors and what i mean by that is what after you eat your glucose goes up and normally your insulin gets made and brings it to normal uh but uh for when insulin goes off either your cells aren't responding to insulin they're called insulin resistance or you know some people don't make enough insulin i i'm actually type 2 diabetic you may not know but I actually am type 2 diabetic. Uh, it was picked up my genome predicted, and I became diabetic after a viral infection, actually, uh, which I caught through my monitoring. So, we, uh, but in my case, I actually make insulin. I just don't release it from the pancreas, which is not common, but it's not unheard of. So, I'm a very special form. There's a very special drug that works for me very well. I actually don't respond to the typical drug called metformin. I respond to this drug that helps promote release from the pancreas. So uh, the point out of all this is that, A, A, we can follow all this with these monitors, but B, what's also special is that everybody reacts to different foods. Some people will spike their glucose in response to banana, others to pasta, others to brown bread, others to white bread. We're all different. It's very personal. And we can follow that with a glucose monitor so you can see exactly how you, what your glucose shifts, which is really, really powerful. So then at the end... Right. Yeah, so then what you do is you avoid the bad foods, the ones that spike you, and you eat the, the ones that don't spike you, which might taste just as good to you. And and so it's a very, so we, same thing, we build a company around this called January AI to help people, you know, select the right foods. They have an amazing food database, and they'll make a recommendation. If this, you know, if you eat, well, from four days of monitoring, we can tell what's going to spike you, what's not. And they have a food recommender, they'll say, all right, you shouldn't be eating this, but try that one instead, <laughs> which should not spike you. It's pretty cool. So these devices are very, very powerful. I don't know if you've ever worn one. They're, they're very eye-opening. I've never worn one, but I use it quite a bit with my patients. And what I find to be very helpful for, like a lot of measurements, it's very helpful for motivating patients. It is. When the patient sees numbers, you know, you can show them this is what's happening. And, you know, this motivates patients to really eat the right foods. And, and it's surprising to me, you know, a lot of foods that we were, like you mentioned, a lot of foods that we would predict uh, increased blood sugar sometimes don't, and other foods do. You know, like, you know, some animal proteins sometimes uh, increase blood sugar more than, than uh, you know, carbohydrates. Yeah, a lot of it depends on what's there. One of my favorite stories is talking to a New York Times reporter. He said, I thought I was eating the healthiest lunch every day, salmon on salad. What could be better than that? 
Then he puts on a glucose monitor, and suddenly he discovers his glucose is spiking through the roof every time he has salmon on, on salad. And guess what it turns out to be? It it's, was, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dressing. He puts a boss and vinegar, which has sugar in it. And so all he had to do then, after he learned that, was leave off the dressing, and he got the healthy lunch he was looking for, but he had no idea he was eating an unhealthy lunch until he put this monitor on himself. Yeah, I had, I had another patient that had one on, and uh, and noticed that during the day at work, the blood sugars were always elevated, no matter what he did, his, his blood sugars were always elevated, and he was extremely stressed at work. And on the weekends, doing eating almost the same foods, his blood sugars were a little bit better. So it was yeah. like the stress of, you know, that's another- That's induced. Yeah, yeah, very, that happens. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is great information because you would think that, that all nutritionists would have their patients wear their blood glucose monitoring and they would know exactly what to tell them to eat or not to eat, right? So, uh, I think so. I think they should do that. That, that would make everybody's life much easier. Yeah. And now, as a psychiatrist, they use a lot of medications sometimes that do increase blood sugar, do increase, you know, do create, a, unfortunately, metabolic uh, syndrome just because of the nature of the medications that they are. So they would be very helpful to have uh, the aid of uh, any. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. also, as a psychiatrist, they can see patients who are extremely anxious about the health of what's happening that could become more anxious, just constantly monitor my heart rate is going too high. Am I getting a heart attack or? Yeah, we're just starting this area ourselves. We're following depression and anxiety and, and bipolar, actually, uh, uh, mostly in the area of depression right now. So we started our first study and we're trying to use wearable devices and, and other biomarkers, very similar to what we've been talking about. Although here we're using a, something called microsampling. We can talk about that if you like. But we're trying with the wearables to see exactly what you're saying, see how people's heart rate, heart rate variability shifts, you know, in response to treatment. We have people going through various treatments, uh, mostly trying more uh, lifestyle kinds of treatments. Believe it or not, we're actually following people who do Tony Robbins and <laughs> folks like that to see how what's happening with their with their physiology and their, and their biochemistry after they go through this. And many, through the classical methods, you know, using surveys and questionnaires are actually, um, you know, seeing improvements in their depression and, and their mental health. So we're trying now to get good biomarkers. Comes back to what we talked about earlier. How do you know people are improving if you can't measure it? And that, I think that's a real limitation in my mind in psychiatry and, and in the mental health field in general. The, the measures are not as, they're, they're not as good as we'd like them to be. Definitely. Yeah. Then what's your opinion about tests like the grail Galeri test where, you know, the DNA testing for early cancers, you know, I think that's a fascinating area of, uh, you know, preventive oncology, you know, because I'm a preventive cardiologist. So I, I really like to focus in on prevention. A lot of my patients, I, we do it in our office because a lot of our patients, they read the Tori Robbins book. And they were, then they want the test. But I agree with it. And I think that yeah, I want, want to know your opinion. I've done it twice myself. So it, it's not great for early stage, to be honest, but it's early days and I'm sure they'll get better. It's great for late stage cancer, like stage three, stage four. And it depends on the cancer. For some, it can, you know, the better ones, maybe 30% of stage one. Well, it's for all cancers, right? Yeah. So it's better than any, and some it totally doesn't catch early stage, but it, even still, a lot of people don't know when they have late stage cancer, believe it or not. So we, I would argue it sells value, especially when you're talking about things like ovarian cancer and such. So uh, I, I think it's great. I think it's early days. I think we'll get better. It's expensive, as you probably know. It's about a thousand bucks, right? The test. So, but it's early days, and I think now I know other groups all trying similar things. So uh, it'll probably drive the price down in, in the long run. So. But it's the classic case of following people while they're healthy and see if you can catch things. And it has done that. It's been successful in some cases. So I, I would like to hear about the, the drop of blood testing because I do some dry blood testing. You know, I have patients in other countries and, and huh? it's do a real blood test. So right. dry blood testing, like Boston Heart does a little bit of that. But I, yeah. I would like to know your your you know, your your testing in a drop of blood, you know, sort of what Theranos tried to do, but I think you guys are doing it. <laughs> <successful>. right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no. So we spent about six years on this, believe it or not, testing all the different matrices you could think of and then various things. And ultimately, we've settled on two devices where they collect very fixed amounts of blood. They And then we are able to get the, the molecules off the, out of the blood collected that way. And actually, so what you do is you, it's what you say, you prick your finger, you absorb it onto, we'll call it a tiny little sponge, a very fixed volume. And then um, you actually FedEx it into the lab and then we analyze it. And most of the molecules we measure are stable. And what are we measuring? We're measuring important immune molecules called cytokines or important metabolites and lipids. We can measure, believe it or not, over 2,200 items in your blood, many of which are just really key. And a lot of these glucose control measurements I, I talked about earlier, like insulin, something called incretins. Again, this is for the aficionado, but they're these important hormones that are really, really important in glucose control. We can measure all those, it turns out, right out of these tiny little droplets. And so we've been able then to follow how people react to different foods or different environments. And so just as one fun example, we had 32 people drink something called an Insure Shake. It's this thing you could buy in CVS, Insure. And so we basically um, uh, had people drink that. And the amazing thing was everybody reacted differently. So some people had their carbs go up, other people had their carbs go down. The more important things were some people had their inflammatory markers go down, meaning the shake actually suppressed inflammation, and other people went up. And you just had to measure it to see. So we could actually see people's response to food. And again, for the glucose control measurements, we think this is a big deal. And so what we're in a position to do now is just see exactly how you're reacting to things. As you may know, 10% of the U.S. population has inflammatory bowel syndrome. And so, um, you know, we could probably, we hope to be able to figure out what's triggering this in many cases. So, so that's the goal. So it's turned out to be very, very powerful. And then, you know, just for fun, we followed me over seven days and I could see, and I was wearing smartwatches and this continuous glucose monitoring, and we could see exactly what events were correlated with what kind of biochemistry. And as an example, there's something called alpha synuclein, which is involved in Parkinson's. We could actually follow that pattern in my blood. Now, I'm not at risk for Parkinson's, but imagine you are at risk for Parkinson's. We'd probably be able to tell you what's spiking you. And then maybe you would want to mitigate that so that you would be less at risk for getting Parkinson's. Now, is so, this something that could be uh, changed into like a continuous blood monitor? That uh, Yeah, good question. Right now, it's, yeah, right now, it's pricks. I think it's continuous. We could do a few molecules, but not that many, not 2,200, at least not right now. That'll take a while. Uh, but So what we've done too, we've commercialized that one in two ways. One is a company called YOLO. You can do this. You can mail in. You can take the test. Oh, uh, you know, announce that one again, I-O-L-L-O. -L -L -O. You would actually uh, do just that. You get a kit. And all you do is prick yourself, mail it in. Well, that one actually, sorry, that one is a device you put here. And it collects these very small droplets of blood. You mail it in. And we'll tell you about over 500 metabolites, if you will, what their levels are. Many of them are involved in pretty important things like depression, uh, insulin res uh, resistance, which is this diabetes precursor. All kinds of interesting things you can measure from this drop of blood. Um, and they're not, they're, it's not an FDA approved test or anything like that. It's kind of a wellness test. But if you see something off, you might just go in and get further checkups on it. And, and we think the information is, is actionable from, again, a, a, a nice wellness standpoint. So this is the kind of thing I'd like to see happen in the future where people get up in the morning, you know, maybe once a week mail or once a month mail one of these tests. Right now we're saying every three months. We, we honestly don't even know how often we should be following people if you think about it. What yeah. wearables you do all the time, but the other stuff we, we don't know. Should you be doing this every week, every month, every year? And it probably depends on the test. And the more data you get uh, when you, when you, like you were saying, you know, with the Ensure, you had a group of people that reacted completely the opposite of another group of people. And right. Select enough of these groups. Hopefully we can de start to understand, you know. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. We want to understand that. Right. Well, as physicians, we have the same patients with the same exact symptoms, and that patient will respond completely different with the same right. patient, right? That you have to try 
different uh, combinations, but the symptoms and the presentation was the same. So right. that person reacted differently. We'd and like to predict that coming in. Some of that you can predict from your DNA sequence, actually, for drug reactions. But uh, You know, we've done that. I don't know if we're there, there. We, yeah. It depends on the medication, yeah, absolutely. Not for most of them, the answer is no, we're not there yet. <laughs> Because we know possibly that that patient will need uh, the right amount of medication, more medication or less medication, depends on how they metabolize the medication, but not the efficacy of the medication, not if the medication yeah, that's, yeah. take care of the symptoms. Well, especially in your field, right? The best drugs work in one in four cases, uh, something like that. It's amazing. But also yeah. the genetic tests yet, yet don't. Help. You know, we don't have any tests for efficacy. We have better tests for dosing and side effects when it comes to drugs. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. From a cardiac standpoint, it'd be great to have a monitor, you know, because when you get ischemic, you do, do you release certain uh, enzymes and troponins and high sensitivity troponins. So, there, you know, you can predict uh, with testing if you did it continuously, what's mm -hmm. the problem? And, uh, and since, you know, heart attacks are so prevalent, I think that uh, would be uh, a great thing to have to, you know. Absolutely. Like sensor. Let's say you have a sensor on at night. It's telling your high sensitivity troponins are going up. Go ahead, check the next day. You know, that make sure you. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think in your space, in the cardio space, it's a no brainer. And what's your feeling on polygenic risk scores? I mean, I, I, I've been doing that recently on my patients in terms of trying to see what their overall risk is. Uh, you know, it's a new thing. And, uh, What's your opinion about this? Yeah, it works on the top couple of percent of people, the top two or three percent. So if you're at the extreme end, it actually worked on me and predicted my diabetes, believe it or not. It doesn't work on most people because the the risk score is not strong enough. Uh, so again, if you wind up at the very far end of the distribution, it, it, it does have value, but not for most people. I think as we add on more data types, we actually have new ways of analyzing genomes, so I hope to fix that in the future uh, <laughs> or make it better. It's not completely worthless, but it's not good as what that is. Well, polygenic risk scores, you know, I'm sure you can explain it better than I can because you're you have a genetic <laughs> background. What, what is a polygenic risk score as opposed yeah, so, to a single gene causing a disease, you know? Yeah, so so let's walk through a single gene first. Right now, the best way to interpret your genome are these what what are called single gene mutations. And the classic example are the BRCA genes. So you may know that they, they put you at, at women at high risk for breast and ovarian cancer. Men so well, high risk for breast cancer. And so if you have a mutation in that gene, you know, you'll get screened more often. And, and women often, at, once they pass their childbearing years, actually, um, you know, have their ovaries and, and um, uterus uh, or uh, fallopian tubes removed. So it's a way uh, of, uh, you know, it's a way of telling you you're on the alert for something and getting screened more often. Polygenic risk score, that, so that works well for these single gene mutations. There, there are many others like it as well, some for the heart, like I mentioned earlier. The polygenic risk score is, is, comes from the fact that most diseases are really com are common, and they're not due to single gene mutations like diabetes, coronary artery disease. A lot of the heart diseases are not single gene mutations. And they're thought to be due to lots of changes that are very common in the population, but a very small effect. And if you're just so unfortunate, you inherit all these bad um, the changes, if you will, you're more at risk. And if you get the good ones, you're less at risk. And so, uh, and we all have, they're thought to be due to thousands of changes. And so, again, it's just kind of like a, a crapshoot, if you will. If you're at the, the bad end, you're, you're at high risk. And if you're at the good and you're at low risk and so uh and again they they kind of work and and they, they're not perfect for a couple of reasons one is they don't take the environment into account which probably weighs in of something called interaction score and the other is you the way they people do it is they actually just add up these risks and it, you, you can't just add them it's a little more complicated than that so genetics is little. so i think we'll get better at it uh it just said it's and it's early days i just yeah so Again, it'll work for that top group. Okay, and you know, you you mentioned the environment, um, the and 
What about measuring the environment, measuring pollutants and things like that, the exposome and things like that? Yeah, so we're doing a ton there. That's what this device is oh. all about. It's all experimental. Um, it's called the exposometer. So it's measuring that there's a lot of standard ones out there. Probably this audience has heard of purple air, which is I have no affiliation with, but they'll measure like the particulates in the air and something called PM 2.5. It's the size of the particle. And um, so the common ones do that. They'll measure this these particulates, they'll measure temperature, humidity, but they don't measure the exact thing that's going on. So that's an area we're working pretty hard on. So with our device, we measure the standard stuff, but we also capture all the particles there. And then we we actually can figure out through sequencing what what's there, what pollen's there, what bacteria there, what molds are there, if you ha- if you will. And it's turned out to be, and then under that we have a chemical absorbent. So we can sell it pesticides or car you know, cancer causing compounds are there, what have you. So we really get a very complete picture. Um, so this is not something you wear all the time. You you carry it with you? and I carry it with me. I used to wear it on my shoulder. Then we have a new device that's a little bit smaller than this one. Just don't have one right here with me. But uh, yeah, so it will be personal. And, uh, you know, you can put it in your home wherever. And the power of this is that where, you know, you'll be able to see what you're exposed to. And it turns out location is a big deal. So some areas have lots of pesticides that some areas not so much so turns out d is everywhere but that you know that's the thing that keeps your bugs off you so uh that actually is everywhere but it's more in some places than others we can measure all that it's pretty cool and we can measure what biologicals are there and you can correlate it with which ones are causing inflammation and which ones aren't for example and in my case i have mild allergies i always thought it was pine but after measuring my ex- the, the exposures around me turns out it best associates with eucalyptus oh. so i think i'm actually allergic to eucalyptus and not pine and in hindsight that made a lot of sense i there i'm not very allergenic on the east coast where there aren't very many eucalyptus trees but i am on the west coast where there's a ton of them oh that's uh you know even from a heart disease perspective these air pollutants are very much connected yeah. with you know unstable heart disease so i can believe it yeah yeah uh, be able to have you know one device that measures everything you know like uh you know we'll get there <laughs> we're not there now but we will get there and then we know that all these pollutants have a strong effect on fertility on that uh, you know yeah well that's a really sensitive time too during pregnancy right when it's thought that a lot of autism is caused these kids getting a lot of uh, early puberty and so there is right you know data that we're still collecting and trying to absolutely yeah. And yeah on our health and well-being or probably mental health i wouldn't be surprised if they have a great effect of mental yeah I'll, i'm sure they do and nobody's measured it so we, this is why we need to start measuring i think it's a very understudied area the environmental exposures yeah one of the things that needs to happen is what i find is uh the whole healthcare system is is you know, not maybe not be ready for this sort of thing because I measure a lot of things. And when my patients take this to their regular doctor, they see all this stuff that they really have never seen before. And they, their immediate reaction is it's not valuable. You know, this yeah. Yeah. That's right. The wearables, when they, you know, we've been pushed, we started sequencing healthy people before it was fashionable and physicians were really angry with me oh you're just gonna find all these things turn everybody into hypochondriacs and now they don't say that so much same it came out with the wearables when we started putting these on people and i i'm a big champion of wearables and they say well they're not that accurate well that's wrong and it turns out they are more accurate than what you measure in a physician's office and yeah they're just very very powerful health monitors and and again i think the medicine is conservative it tends to push back on anything new instead of embracing it and so you know it makes sense to evaluate things carefully i totally agree with that but i don't think you should instantly dismiss it which is what the tendency is so i did think we do have to uh, educate physicians it's a big part of all of this yeah and a cult you know like a cult stroke is a big deal you know like people come in with strokes we never know why they have a stroke and if you study carefully like with implantable monitors many times they have atrial fibrillation so that's one of the benefits i think of these wearables is that i've seen a good number of my patients come in and they do have atrial fibrillation you know wow. come as a you know heart fat maybe it's not accurate in determining what it is 
but at least the sensitivity is good. It tells you. It gives you a red alert, right? Yeah, it tells you something's off, yeah. And then you'll figure it out later. And it's a huge deal because it, you know, it's the biggest, one of the biggest uh, causes of stroke. So it's not a, you know, not a little thing. Uh-huh. So if we would have to ask you to tell one of our listeners, if they want to buy one, start with one work wearable, uh, which one would you recommend? Well, it's a toss-up between a smartwatch and a continuous glucose monitor. I won't tell you which brand because I think it gets... It also depends a little on your preference. Some you have to charge more and some less. But uh, I do think if you're at all concerned about diabetes running in the family, uh, I would. it's not an either-or either way. Anyway, I think you should do a continuous glucose monitor uh, from time to time. I, I predict in the future, they're over the counter in Europe, meaning you can get them right in, in a drugstore. Here, you still need a physician. Uh, so, I, I I guess I'm going to push for two. We <laughs> 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 just could go smarter and the smartwatch. How about, how about things like an aura ring? What do you think about that? Yeah, or an aura ring. They're, they're good. Uh, yeah, they're lower resolution, but they measure sleep very, very well. Uh, and the battery's probably not as good, but th- they're they're good. I mean, uh, I'd say a watch or a ring. So m- many people don't like watches; they prefer rings. Uh, they'd rather re- they wear a ring than nothing. <laughs> have you gotten used to wear all these watches? I have, yeah. So I, I've been doing it for years. I've been wearing watches for probably eight or nine years. So. And how how's it changed what you do? Any- well, again, I I saw my COVID. I saw many things with my watch, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I it definitely tips me off. The glucose monitor has totally changed the way I eat. Okay, because I know what spikes me now, what doesn't spike me. I know with certain physical exercise, I can suppress the spikes, things like that. Uh, yeah. So tell, say a little bit more about that. So you have a spike, and then what do you do to suppress that? What kind of exercise do you do? Yeah, well, what it, I mean, one of the things we do, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap in a second here, but um, one of the things we, we do with the January AI program is we'll have people eat their favorite spoo- food, which is often a sweet <laughs> first thing in the morning. Next day, they do it, and then they do a brisk 15-minute walk afterwards, and you will see that very much suppresses your your glucose spikes. So physical exercise, both before and after the meal, especially after the meal, will will help mitigate this. So it's really good for you. And w- w- some of the one things we found in the lab is that a walk after dinner leads to lower lower glucose the next day. So we're and and you should stop eating three hours before bedtime. These are all examples of things that you should do for better lifestyle, you know, management of your glucose. And you'll see it at a personal level too. Before TV, before yeah, any people did used to do that. But after a meal, they would go out for a walk, uh, meet other people. I do it every night. I walk the dog every night now, and I try to stop eating before bedtime. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you very much. We, our listeners, are going to love this, and uh, it was great speaking to you. And uh, this is going to change some of the things we do. So we really appreciate it. Oh, love, love the conversation. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, very good.